Nah. <laughs> okay. Um hi y'all. Uh it is up in the air episode three. My name is Mason and I am with another uh just one of my besties. Like it's for years our friendship has manifested so beautifully. Um and I'm sitting here today with uh Anastasia Warren. Um, somebody that I graduated the School of Visual Arts um, with in 2018. Uh, we both have a degree, uh, undergrad in um, Visual and Critical Studies. Um, and I'm sure we'll get into it, but to uh, give a, a brief description of the multiple hats that Anastasia puts on, um, they at the very forefront are an incredible artist, a performance artist, a sculptor, um, a lot of your work um, investigates like identity a lot of the stuff early on especially while we were in school was institutional critique um and i think imitation has always been a key theme in a lot of your performance um which i've uh as of recently you've worked under um an alter ego pseudonym kind of uh, as void thought um and you actually performed at uh a show i put together earlier this year which also feels like a decade ago now <laughs> um which uh took my breath away um for uh, no bra no candies uh, shout out to the movie 13 um and also uh you most recently and i think why i'm bringing you here today to kind of discuss all these themes um, is that you have been doing a lot of work within community, uh, specifically the community you were born and raised in. Oh, oh my god, wait, the, the major, you are born and raised from the Bronx, which is also major. <laughs> yes. Um, and you um, have had an incredible um, opportunity to kind of delve into tenants organizing um, uh, within kind of the uh, apartment building that you were like raised in um, your whole life. So there's just like such a personal tie to what that sort of political uh, community organizing looks like. Um, and I'm interested in kind of, outside of maybe kind of, um, just, to, <laughs> just to kind of kind of come at this conversation with like hard facts or, you know, things. I'm not necessarily interested in giving like a play by play of like what 2020 has looked like for tenants, orga tenants organizing in New York. Um, I'm more interested, I think, in maybe kind of um, hearing about just maybe month by month, like how maybe a lot of these different um, parts of you or identity and your practice have kind of congealed into this moment. Um, which is kind of a lot to kind of dive into in 30, but I'm, I, 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 um, I feel very confident that you can shed a lot of light on that, <laughs> as always. Um, so maybe um, with that freeform kind of introduction, um, I'm interested maybe in kind of hearing about um, the early, earlier in the year around kind of like March, April, how you were kind of experiencing um, the early the pandemic, um, what circumstances led to you organizing with people within your building, and um, maybe just kind of the early actions that you helped organize um, within community to help get that sort of organization off the ground. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, thank you for that intro um, and just setting us up. Um, yeah, it's interesting. And I'd mentioned this that it's like you kind of asked me to do this at the perfect time where I feel like I've kind of settled in and accepted and processed a lot of my experience of this year. Um, there's a work to do, but um, yeah and giving myself the space for that. Um, and so I guess I would start with um, uh, one. So I um, moved back with my parents, with my family in like September of 2019 after being out of the country for some time um, at an artist residency in Germany and came back broke and 
living with my parents. And um, that was an experience that I don't recommend. I'm sure a lot of people this year have uh, really been steeped in that and what it does, um, especially when, you know, you can have a lot of love for the people you share DNA with or just call your family and know it's your family, but living with them is just not it. Um, so I kind of came into this year having made myself like really small um, to fit into this space that I didn't really fit into anymore, both like emotionally and physically. I was in the room like on the couch or on an air mattress and just stacking my bread up to get gone was kind of the, um, yeah, the motive. And so, um, yeah, I, my, well, I don't know if I'm like jumping, but so my grandfather to just, okay, yeah. Um, Cause the timeline, the timeline of it all to like make it linear, I don't know, I'm gonna try my best. But um, one thing I'll start with is, so living in this building um, in, like the kind of like Southwest Bronx, like off the Grand Concourse around where Yankee Stadium is kind of. Um, I hadn't lived in that neighborhood for years. And um, it was somewhere I, like, I go back to frequently with my, my mom, my dad, and my grandfather and my great aunt all lived there and have lived there for decades on decades on decades. So, um, it has both changed a lot in that um, it used to be in better conditions and not changed at all in that the Bronx is really overlooked as a place that, um, that people deserve dignified housing and just general human rights. And I feel like this year, and when I say that I'm talking about, I'm especially talking about housing when I say that. Um, and there's a type of like invisibility and isolation that is already happening, was already happening in the Bronx before there was a pandemic. And so it's not really, oh, hey, Kylie just got here. Um, oh my God. <laughs> oh, sorry. You guys sorry. Know. Yeah. Or wait, Mason. Should we? What should we do? So, um, my mom, dad, grandfather, and great aunt all live in the the building that um, yeah, the the building that they have lived in my entire life. So, I, in a lot of ways, it's changed and not changed and changed again and by that I mean um, there was a time um, in the 80s especially where um, the building was in a better state because I guess yeah I'll talk about the state that it was in at a time um, my grandfather was the and kind of continues to act as the president of the Tenant Association. And so had been for some years and did things like leading um, a rent strike. And I'm kind of blurry on years and dates and stuff like that. But he, he was leading a lot of um, the tenant organizing and things like community watch and um, block parties and gatherings and stuff like that. And um, yeah, continue to do that into today, basically. Um, and so at that time, the building uh, was, and this is how he's described it to me. Um, he was saying that the building was predominantly black and I believe I don't remember who the owners were, but um, something that he has highlighted to me was how um, the management that kind of 
that took over the building some years later in like late even later than the 80s 20th century um the 90s i guess um really did a lot to divide the building like doing things like having people who speak different languages in the same part of the building or by that like like making communication from strategically like kind of putting people in places to cutting off um cutting off like there's like a gate that connects so there's like four sides to the building and there is a gate that divides um two of the sides and it was open and people could just kind of come and go um but at one point and so the the building has switched in the past i think eight years private equity has switched three times which is i can get more into that sort of but basically the landlord at this time was like cutting off that connection and just doing other things that kind of disassembled the association kind of in the long run um and there's some personal things that i'm sure went on um but yeah so knowing that legacy and i was also the beginning of this year working as a home aide for my grandfather um and homemade for my grandfather like during the day and working at pumps during the evenings <laughs> and that was like a world of my own and just like I yeah that's that's what I needed to do for my family and for myself um and so the intersection of that experience was really interesting and that one of those jobs was completely canceled um, because you can't have, you can't do that, <laughs> obviously, like all the clubs shut down and as they should have. Um, and so that looked like, you know, like, I don't know, March something like the first week of March, like getting a text that was like, yeah, the club is closed. <laughs> so uh, no more, no more work for you um but yeah so i was kind of even further like isolated in a way back into like like my my family and my home being like my workspace um which was like kind of doing some really basic care things for my grandfather um and so got really close like even closer to the building kind of out of necessity um uh, out of like both being cornered and recognizing myself as someone who's had the opportunity and privilege to like have this education where I can identify some tools and things to help people subvert power structures within the place that I'm from where, yeah, people don't have that opportunity a lot of the time. And so that looked like, um, that honestly, I was pretty dormant in that until I think it was late, um, late April, uh, someone who was running for Congress in our district at the time um, uh, contacted my grandfather about um, a free food distribution. And basically they didn't know um, for what period of time, but would be providing free meals for us to distribute. And we kind of get the notice for this at a time where we don't even have volunteers like the organization is the tenant association is kind of like disbanded or just kind of yeah not in communication really um and so the same day we get told that we're getting these orders um 
my grandpa and I contact a couple of people who can hopefully help out and have like, excuse me, um, been involved in the organization more recently. Um, and up until like the pandemic, there were more regular meetings and things like that. Like my grandfather had secured, um, had gotten back the community room that was in the building after the landlord kind of illegally took it and was using it as a storage space um, instead of it, or as a storage space and then as an illegal apartment for someone working in management. And like, there's just all of this like, kind of, um, yeah, just mess. Right. And um, illegal things that the landlord was doing. Um, when there are a lot of like things like specifically with tenants that come up too but um yeah so to continue this recount pretty much in that we get we get these meals and we get 200 I think it was 250 meals a day oh and the building the size of the building so there are about there's I mean and, and this is really being like at least there are at least and so there are a lot of people there there are a lot of people who are most um uh, immigrants some undocumented folks and yeah so a lot of people who were the most vulnerable are the most vulnerable, especially at the beginning of um, this global health crisis. So um, with, we get these meals. Hmm? Oh, and I just had a question about that. So with, and I think not to derail from, from uh, the specific story, but I, I do have a question about like, how was it, organizing with such a multicultural kind of community base um because when we talk about i think like community organizing um in a place like new york city it's very different from organizing from like maybe a more uh hegemonic kind of like small town um in the suburbs or not in like a metropolitan area um was there anything specifically that like outside of maybe just kind of like cultural conflicts did that how did that i think kind of expand the project of creating like a like a new tenants union that properly represents um maybe the more contemporary aspect of kind of your building's makeup and also helping kind of i guess um abolish some of the uh kind of barriers that your landlord put up specifically to help um deconstruct i think kind of a lot of your grandfather's like initial work as like a tenants organizer um i would say that the two um would be and continue to sort of be something to navigate our language barriers and making sure that the space is all like inclusive for all types of bodies because we have, um, there are a lot of older people, a lot of people with disabilities in the building, including my grandfather, like he um, had knee surgery some years ago and so uses a cane and like, so to make, um, and that's kind of later in, into when gathering was a little bit more on the table this year when it just started to be like early summer. Um, but um, making materials and like materials as in flyers and things that are all bilingual. And so like if we didn't have, because I, I only speak English and I have been trying to learn Spanish since it became really apparent that that would be like 
that would just change the way I was able to communicate and help most of the people in the building because often um like I just use my personal cell phone number as I contact Anastasia with questions or when we so the food I'll just speak to like the the food distribution first because it kind of just I'll naturally answer some of that question too um but we get about 250 meals a day for five days um and so me and four other people, five other people at a time are kind of um, both like posted up in either lobby. So there are two lobbies, two like huge lobbies um, where we just have the food and have like a free food sign out in English and Spanish and people who come in can see it. And we take like their, their name, their apartment number, how many meals they need, just so we can keep track of like what people's needs are. Um, and, and some people can't come downstairs even, one, because they don't want to because Corona, and then two, because of their own disabilities. And so um, delivering things to people's doors was something that um, me and one other volunteer were doing um, or a couple of other volunteers in our little group. Um, but yeah, so what we tried to do was have someone who spoke English and Spanish at both tables, um, and that wasn't always available. And so sometimes that was, you know, it, you know, just kind of working, I'm trying to think of how to describe it, like trying to communicate without language or with like little bits and pieces of it kind of um but besides that it was pretty straightforward in that setting anyway because it's like we have free food we just need your name and apartment number and um at a certain point once i guess the word started getting around that we were doing this some people from just around the block were coming in too and that was really cool because I don't know if I've ever talked to anyone that's from the building across the street from me. Um, and so, yeah, like told people, you know, like we have to serve this building first, but come at this time and we usually have some meals left and, you know, please come and take those. Um, and taking those people and in, people's information too, just to keep track of like, who needs what. Um, like there was one person from the building across the street that came in, that came to our building and she said she hadn't been outside in three months and had asthma and like was just really scared. And so um, like it was as easy as being like, what's your apartment number? I will just deliver this to you so you don't have to. Um, so yeah, I mean, and that was only for a week, unfortunately. Um, we didn't know when it would end and then the, our last day, we found it on the same day that it would end, that that was our last day basically, um, which was disappointing. And disappointing just because of the clear need there was for that service like um people coming down and like and, you know knowing this like knowing it for a fact and whatever that people are coming down and getting meals for like the eight people who are in their household and imagining like feeding eight people unemployed and making that decision between or or making that decision between food and rent and not even not even a month into all of this maybe it was maybe it was just about a month like sometime in early april people start receiving notices from the landlord like asking for them to pay their rent and mind you like when like people who have lived in the building for decades or not even that have never received that before um and this landlord has always been crooked as in management um they have neglected the building while buying like multi-million dollar properties elsewhere and having 
other buildings that it have way more violations than our building does even so um yeah they are you know kind of putting some kind of pressure on people even when there's a moratorium um their office is closed so it's not like people can get there or even like call and present their questions or concerns or anything there's no communication it's just the only communication is one-sided and it's pay your rent um even though you're unemployed and want to feed your children <laughs> so it was just like what okay huh Oh, I was going to ask, like, with kind of a management service that is so removed from community, um, how I think I'm really interested in kind of hearing about how that creates like a communication barrier between the work that you're doing within your building, um, kind of putting out these kind of fires that are being propped up because of the pandemic and not just like negotiations with somebody that is so far removed from what they own, I guess, which is. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Well, that's kind of like a strong, and this was kind of a, like an icebreaker question we did, like what's a strong tenants association, but the answer is like one. So ideally like a tenant, association or tenant union i'm going to say can act as a representing party for a tenant who may have some kind of conflict or any kind of concern with the landlord it's like the tenant is not standing alone basically it's like um a like working organiz uh, tenant union is able to is a team of people who have both like that institutional memory and legal like like knowledge and um you know a little compassion for people and community that they live with and so kind of act as a buffer between that landlord who is just up on the hill and just receiving your checks um which is a whole nother conversation of like landlord, that's, that's not a job. It's not something, um, it's not something you should do. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, yeah, so especially not something you should do if you're going to harass people. Harass, when I, I just thought of like this instance where um like someone so one way to put pressure on a landlord is to call 311 and while 311 often leads to nothing like or isn't really in it for like a long term change those 311 reports stack up and that turns that's something you can use in a suit or like in any kind of case because it is that is like evidence and so actions like that are something that we talked about organizing and hopefully can actually coordinate um things that are kind of low ass like hey like do you have heat um is there like is the garbage overflowing from the compactor room is the elevator working which often the, that elevator there's an elevator this floor this building is eight build is eight floors and the elevator is out on one side at least at least like once a week it'll feel like even if it's just for a couple of hours what that looks like is people with groceries kids disabilities whatever having to use the other elevator to go up to the roof hopefully the roof door isn't locked and walk over to yeah their side if that even makes sense if like you know my family lives on the eighth floor so it's like the elevator isn't working on our side we walk to the other side go up the elevator walk across the roof and then we're on the eighth floor but not everybody lives on the eighth floor so that being something that's like a regular occurrence and really diminishing people's quality of life and um 
really something that can cause literal injury and bodily harm. So um, things like that, that kind of become normalized because it feels like nobody is looking or nobody is really together in, you know, this isn't okay. We shouldn't accept this. We pay rent. This is unacceptable. Um, and yeah, so um, that sentiment, I feel like, especially after this food drive, um, we, those of us who were like, just continue to be dissatisfied, all of us, all of us who volunteered for that, um, started thinking of ways we could uh, join the movement further in um, like the cancel rent campaign and the general just, um, I guess, heightened awareness of tenant uh, rights organizations like Rights to Council or Met Council on Housing. Um, and yeah, so um, me, someone contacted me actually, who is now kind of my, I like my, we especially like co-organized together and he was someone who had recently lived, moved into the building and contacted me and yeah, about like the cancel rent campaign and so, it kind of takes three people, I want to say, like three people that can like lead and that doesn't limit leadership to three people, but as in when you're just trying to like start something, like having a team of three for decision making and like sharing tasks and to just start to even function is kind of what, um, we ended up doing and like our third person was I've been my neighbor like my whole life of living there basically and so um all of us coming into this as a younger generation that with different experiences that have all been witnesses and victims to like what this landlord does so which is the, the negligence um and yeah, harassment of our community. And so going back kind of to that question of um, like language barriers or like how like we get all those people together, it's having a leadership team that is all of those people, like where everyone can like, you know, yeah, just like see themselves and talk and even when like there are a lot of like something you need is like um like having a translator makes a big difference um for us and yeah there was something else i was going to mention in that oh like well just this another thing just another reason to hate the landlord like rallying together for one person because after calling 311, like they received a threat that like immigration would be called on them um, for that's doing that. So wow. that's like, that's the type of people that we would be, we are dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I say would be, we are, the tense of it has been a personal challenge for me because like this is all going on and I'm trying to stay on top of it. And I kind of described it to you as like, everything's on fire and I'm trying to put it out, but I'm also on fire because um, I just, the stability is not where I was in my life and trying to rally all of this energy. But at the same time, volunteering and doing that did like provide me a type of like, clarity and purpose and like opportunity to use my brain cells when I was just trying to like keep my head down and stack my bread up and get out of my parents house so it yeah I mean just meeting somewhere within that um it really was unexpected for me 
it's something I've, I've both always wanted to see for the building for my community is that people would just have something whether that was like a have something again because there was a time where like I mentioned briefly like block parties and barbecues and meetings and just like people were really in conversation with one another um and like a block association being on the horizon and that looking like you know community care um and leadership and awareness and you know art businesses thriving like just on the block so um that's always something i wanted to see and definitely didn't imagine it was something that i would be working toward this year under these conditions um but it did really give me a place to stand in like the wave of like the emotional physical just like struggle that this year has been um and so uh yeah i would say that like i like i was talking about timeline and tense i'm kind of like that was like from let's say march through like july august ish um and then i kind of realized i needed to take a big step back and take care of myself because i like moved out of my family's in like early july and was trying to just like keep going like just keep uh keep working towards organizing um but was just kind of running on e mentally and all of that so um and i yeah i mean like just to reiterate i mean just accomplishing that much in that time frame is so crazy for even as you mentioned like a core group of three people to take on for a whole building um and the unexpected nature of still feeling particularly entrenched in kind of like the pandemic come mid October now is like such a weird position to kind of have your brain in because you feel like you know so much has progressed forward but you're just so personally stagnant in like so many aspects it's been really nice to watch you you know you now have an artist studio you now have a new apartment that is like holistic and like actually serving you in a way um where you're like once again back in the community that you've fostered throughout your like young adulthood which I, it's been really nice to kind of see you kind of circle back into yourself in a lot of ways as like a close friend of yours obviously um and I, I, I think maybe that question is like with kind of having these two communities that you're so a part of, do you feel like there is like a new sort of, um, I, 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 maybe kind of like in a broader sense, what does community mean to you in 2020? Um, and maybe that's just kind of like a good open-ended kind of question. Where do you kind of see your head at right now? That. um i see community as um i see it as a true act of compassion a true sentiment and act of deep compassion um which is manifested in like you know not agreeing with or understanding or you know not judging people um like giving letting people meet you where they're at and vice versa kind of um like really and truly knowing that like there are just so many ways people are living their lives um and like 
coming to everybody with the same kind of integrity and sincerity when you want to help or when you need help and um yeah i think um right now where i'm at and it's interesting you would describe it that way like kind of these two places that i'm in um where i like yeah as an artist one of my um greatest motivations is like the power that I think that specifically like clay has to bring people together. And the way that like I think of clay as this material that is this metaphor for self actualization and also is just naturally a communal activity and something that is really precious to me because um, of like this vision I have where everyone can make the things that they need with their own two hands and with each other and yeah um so i would say that community to me looks like yeah compassion and also imagination like i would say that growing up the way i did and where i did in the bronx like imagination was the best thing you know continues to be and i think is um once you can really imagine something and it it feels closer and when you share that image and that imagination with other people and like not to sound like super like kumbaya like woo woo but sincerely like when you can share a vision with people and realize that everyone is actually bringing a lot like everyone has so much to to share and when you can bring that out in yourself and other people um is when change happens i think because i know there have been so many moments this year where I felt really small and like my confidence was just not there. Um, and somebody like made me feel seen and it just started back up sort of. Um, and like I returned to a place that, to a place from a place that I didn't, I could hardly see myself out of. Um, so I think knowing that a lot of people are there, what I mean by like, just meeting people with like an intense, like, I see you and really making that a priority in how you individual Oh, I think you broke up for a sec. Okay, wait, you're back. Oh, <laughs> oh. oh yeah, you were friends for a sec too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I love Zoom. My God. Uh, <laughs> um, cool. I think not to take up too much of your time, I have one more question for you. And I think it just kind of leads from kind of community. And I mean, the reason why I wanted to talk to you is just, as I mentioned before, even starting this was like the, so much of what this community work right now, I believe is like bringing out of, oh God, am I, am I super frozen right now? Oh God. Oh, okay. <laughs> a little bit, but you're coming through. I can hear you okay. It's just a oh, okay. little bit. Okay, all right, perfect. Yeah. perfect. <laughs> um, a biggest interest, one of the bigger interests in this project that I'm trying to kind of like understand is this personal kind of um, uh, bringing together kind of the head and the hand, where exactly we can um, 
insert our bodies, insert our ideas into kind of like tangible places, tangible forms that um, actually, I kind of think, progress a certain type of um, progressive, you know, towards uh, uh, this kind of like leftist uh, progressivism that I think the people that I'm bringing together really want to kind of see in the world and why there's like, there's been so much political conflict um, in kind of insurrecting that type of um, change. Um, I, and I think housing specifically has in a lot of ways become this kind of pillar of um, the current political moment because of us, I think maybe having time now to reassess what home really means um, to us. Um, it's now this kind of forced place of education, practice, work, sleep, leisure. Um, there's a versatility to it now that um, has really bombarded it um, in a way that uh, maybe some of us just really weren't, we didn't have that strong of a connection to before this. Um, and outside in the external circumstance of where we go to bed, where we, you know, shower, you know, change, want Netflix, whatever, there's this constant um, conflict with being out of work, not having access to food, um, any sort of assistance at this point, completely dry. Um, and it's always in the examples that you've brought up, um, for a lot of us, it is in a constant uh, state of possibly being taken away from us. I mean, this eviction crisis that we're like living through now is probably one of the most insidious um, public crises we've ever lived in. I mean, that, that it, it's really hard to kind of think about how rough of a winter it's going to be with so many people losing their homes. Um, and it makes tenant organizing such an important uh, way to kind of actively engage within community, um, despite these barriers put up um, in you know, so many ways. I mean, like you talk about it so clearly about how it's designed to not um, be a tangible way to protect oneself from people in positions of power. Um, I guess in kind of closing out on this specific example, um, and I know that as you've kind of taken the last couple of months to kind of take your head out of water and just kind of breathe and protect yourself and your, your selfhood, you've also mentioned briefly that you're interested in kind of stepping back into kind of lending a hand into this. Um, what what I, I guess it could we could go we could go either way. Uh, what I, I'd be interested in hearing what you're hoping in stepping back into this. What you're hoping to achieve? Do you have any clear intentions that you're setting for yourself um, to help with community um, or with kind of like tenants organizing? Um, or we could maybe kind of talk about I think like. Um, uh, I, I, well, I, I guess maybe we could end on that. Like, I'm interested in kind of the intentions that you're hoping to kind of set with this ongoing project. Because, I mean, with that being said, this is like really your first time doing this sort of work. Um, thank you so much for being so honest with kind of the hardships that it has. Um, but uh, yeah, but I don't, I don't know. What, what are you thinking? I'm now. I'm just starting to ramble, so <laughs> I could definitely. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I think that's a great, I think that's a great place to kind of, you know, mm. just, just sit on. Um, I would say that in my own experience of housing insecurity, a kind of thing that I've needed to do is, you know, and it's so much harder or so much easier said than done. That's not even something I think I've fully achieved, but making like yourself home and having a place in my mind and in my body and myself that is a sanctuary and 
you know, everyone deserves to be able to externalize that in their house and their like housing is healthcare for so many reasons. Um, and so with like this winter approaching, um, I don't have an answer. I'm not, I don't think you're asking me for an answer, but just like, it's- yeah, No, not at all. It's, yeah, it's really, um, it's really scary. It's just um, the thought of like what, you know, like powers of be at the, like what Cuomo, what landlords will just let happen to people is um, disgusting. And so I think a goal that I have as I'm um, now like feeling like whole again and like ready to maybe take on some more things um, to like be a part of this um, is to successfully like organize a rent strike in the building where like tenants are in a situation. And I haven't even really talked much about my own building where I currently live now in Bed-Stuy, um, but in the Bronx, my goal is to, and that's a long-term thing, like 10 organizing is the long game. I definitely, you know, in July was like, oh, we'll get rent canceled by November. <laughs> like that was my vision and, you know, keep that energy, keep the ambition, but also, um, you know, recognize that you're planting seeds is kind of me to myself basically, but yeah. I would say that um, uh, like to be able to make people feel seen and empowered in the place that they live and like they don't owe the landlord anything because some people really like they owe them something. Like you need to work and of course, again, like it's vulnerable people who kind of feel that way. And so the, the counter is like, no, you deserve dignified housing and support during a global health crisis um, is what is priority. And I wanna make that happen. Um, and the I being just anyone in the community. Um, and not just because, I mean, definitely because like, if you're doing well, then I'm doing well. And that's kind of the, maybe the immediate sort of setting of, you know, health, but it's also so much less transactional than that. It's like, I mean, it's like, I don't know. And this is idealism, but it's like, I just think that's the way that I'm, like if you can help, you should help. Um, and that's really simplifying because being able to help being in a position where you can extend any part of yourself um, to have the resource of time and money, time or money or like neurotypical just state of being, all of that kind of comes into um, the answer to the question, like, can you extend yourself? So I think um, really noticing that and being so fiercely honest with yourself and with your enemies as in landlords and um, Cuomo, uh, <laughs> that is the kind of like, that's what's needed. Um, yeah, is like, and these are just words, I feel like when I list them out, but they really are things I've meditated on, but like compassion, integrity, and um, I don't know, that's a lot already. Let's practice and learn more about for myself in order to um, 
be okay and even consider looking out for other people. So. Um, yeah, I, 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 mean, I, mean, I hope that I hope I didn't just. No, I, I, this whole show is just a ramble. Um, <laughs> and I, I kind of love, I love the energy of a good ramble. I love the good ideas that spring from thought experiments. And I'm really thankful for your candor and uh, always, I mean, just your mind is so lovely. And I just love the way that uh, you articulate your own experience, lifehood, and just being. So thank you really much, so much for, I don't know, just taking the time to talk. And I think this is like a good place to end. Um, but not before uh, we plug you, of course, because this is a fucking TV show. <laughs> so um, if people are interested in uh, getting uh, in contact with you, maybe they um, see something in this conversation that um, maybe uh, inspires them and kind of, you know, even just wants to say hi or maybe, you know, shoot their shot in the DMs where could we... Uh, <laughs> where could we find you probably <laughs> well um, there, there's one more thing I, I did want to mention that I kind of forgot to mention too just in uh, yes I will I will plug myself but right. also in community organizing like yeah we have that long game but also things like you know like a free library and book club and like skill share things like those are like the things that are the glue to any sort of bigger movement we're trying to do. So those little things I didn't really get too into, but those are also big, exciting, and more immediate goals that I think are gonna like come together sooner than rent is canceled, kind of fortunately, unfortunately. But still very exciting though. Anyway. Yeah, still really, you know, yeah. makes me smile thinking about it and the prospect of all of that. Um you can find me at void thought on instagram that's v-o-i-d-t-h zero t um and you can check out my work at anastasia warren photo.com um the link is there on my instagram as well um yeah there's more to come work-wise i'm doing I'm really gearing myself up to like do ceramics right now. Um, and I'm excited for that. Yeah. Yeah. This is like a very big detour for like an artist combo that has, we didn't really talk about your own personal practice at all, but I would like to reemphasize that, you know, Anastasia makes some of my favorite work and uh, the, the, the journey that you have been on, on your Instagram specifically, um, in a performance space uh, has really been some of the best, my favorite content of 2020. So please take a look. Like I mentioned, Anastasia is also single. So uh, please, um, <laughs> I'm just trying to be a good friend out here. So <laughs> try to cover all aspects of what we're needing, craving and desiring in this pandemic. Um, thank you so much, Anastasia. <laughs> Thanks, Mason. Um, yeah. Peace and blessings. Thanks um, for having me. Of course. <laughs> oh, man. It is muggy out today, but I kind of like it. I don't know. It's very... It's cute. Um, thanks for watching. Um, yeah. I, what can I say more than I just love Anastasia. Uh, next week, I'll be back again on Monday with another person to interview uh, <laughs> uh and yeah um yeah hopefully it won't be over zoom this time i'm kind of over that but conflicting schedules and coronavirus so you know how that shit go anyway uh i'll <laughs> see you guys next week um peace and blessings bye